Christina, I just want to express uh, our our deep love and appreciation for you. And I, I genuinely mean that. We have come to love you. And uh, part of the reason I keep coming back is how much I love uh, your pastor. We, Christy and I, love uh, Gary and and the friendship we've had over these years and Cheryl, and they're just precious friends to us. But I also want to tell you, I keep coming back, one, because Gary keeps inviting me and I've never said no to him on that invitation, but it's also because we, we really do have learned to love you. And uh, thanks for treating us like family. We feel like family. And I'm so thankful for this church and the way God is working here. Uh, I, I just believe you've had an amazing history and you also have a God-ordained future. And I, I look forward to hearing about what you're doing uh, in your community to change your world and, and also the way that uh, this church is bringing glory to God. So on behalf of Christy and I, uh, Gary and Cheryl, we love you. Thank you for, uh, for this very kind invitation. The hospitality has been amazing. Thank you. Am I up here too soon? Okay, all right. Just want to make sure. Uh, so a few of you have asked about if if there's any writing that backs up part of what I'm talking about this week, and, and particularly the idea of holiness, and actually there is, uh, about uh, four years ago, the Board of General Superintendents asked me to write a book uh, called Way Truth Life, Discipleship as a Journey of Grace. And the way that it's framed is it's framed around the five aspects of grace in the Bible, seeking grace, saving grace, sanctifying grace, sustaining grace, and sufficient grace. But, it, but it's taught, the whole theme of the book is around holiness discipleship. That's part of what I've been teaching. And so uh, I don't make anything on this, so this isn't self-promoting. I don't make money if you buy this book because I didn't want to make money on the denomination. And, but we, this has now been translated in about 40 languages around the world. So this is something that Nazarenes around the world are reading and using, and God is, uh, and, and a lot of things around Journey of Grace. If you go to nazarene.org, which is the Nazarene official website, there's lots of resources there. There's lots of material. I'm sure Gary has pointed you there before, but just go to Journey of Grace on the nazarene.org website. You can get all kinds of teaching, uh, and various resources. But if you want to go to Amazon and get the book, Way Truth Life, Discipleship is a Journey of Grace, you can get it in about any language you can imagine. So if you want to get one for your Hispanic speaking or your Spanish speaking friend, do that. If you have a Portuguese speaking friend, do that. French, whatever it may be. All right. So I want to talk to you tonight about holiness and prayer. Holiness and prayer. And I, um, my confession to you right up front is that the reason I've, for many years, I, I was hesitant to preach uh, deeply about prayer because I felt so inadequate in my own prayer life. I just, it wasn't that I didn't pray, it's just that I didn't feel like it was where it needed to be. And what preachers tend to do is they tend to kind of avoid things that sometimes they don't feel like is uh, as fruitful as it needs to be in their own life. Um, but one of the advantages of the, uh, the, the pandemic for me was that I had a little bit of a travel sabbatical. Uh, normally, Christy and I are traveling about 70% of the year, and I've not really figured that out in days, but is 70% away from home. We've done that now for going on 11 years. And so to have a break where we just stayed home for a while was, was a blessing. And it was during that time that I really began to drill down on my own prayer journey. And the book that I've written on that is called The Praying Pastor. And it is a book with a title that has pastor in it, but I will say to you, it's not it's not just for pastors. It's an autobiography of my own prayer journey, 
with all of my, uh, you know, the, the valleys and the mountaintops and, and things that I have learned and I am learning about the life of prayer. And I want to make that really clear tonight. I am on the journey with you on understanding and deepening my own prayer life. But I was just looking at that book again this morning on my iPad and I turned to Christy and I just said, God is still speaking to me about some of the things that he led me to, to put on paper back in 2020. And I'm still moved by that, which is a weird thing to say that I, some of the things that some of the uh, insights I felt like the Lord gave me in Revel, in Revelation was is still moving to me, and I'm still growing in that. So uh, the premise of the book is very, very simple, that there's a difference between a praying pastor and a pastor who prays. Say it differently. There's a different difference between a pastor who prays and a praying pastor. All pastors pray. It's in our job descriptions. We pray at funerals. We pray in worship services. We pray at weddings. We pray at football games. We pray at potlucks. We, we pray over the phone. We pray through text. I mean, we pray and we pray a lot. When I was a pastor for 18 years, I was praying dozens of times a day. But, but if I look back over those 18 years of pastoring and my prayer journey, I, I've now come to realize that if I had to choose, was I a pastor who prayed or was, was I really a praying pastor, a pastor who was committed to the secret life of prayer and the ongoing life of communication with God in a moment-by-moment -moment basis, I would, I, would, I would honestly say to you, I think I was more of a pastor who prayed. And there were certainly moments where I felt so deeply you know, dependent on God in prayer and deeply insufficient to do the task that he was calling me to do. But, but largely my prayer life as a pastor was I would wake up in the morning, I would have my devotions, I would pray over my day, ask God to bless what I was about to do, and then I would kind of go do it lean on my own aptitudes and my own giftings and my own skills and, and my own gifts that God had given to me. And, and there were moments where I felt myself coming back into that, you know, that moment by moment praying, but, but on the whole, that wasn't my journey. And I'm not throwing myself under the bus. Uh, I was growing in prayer. I was, tr I would, God knows I was, I had misunderstandings probably of prayer to a certain degree. And I want to explain some of that tonight, but but God blessed the churches I pastored. The churches grew. There were people being saved. There were people who were being filled with the Spirit, people being called into ministry. We were working deeply in our community, and there was a lot of fruit to the glory of God in those 18 years. But as I reflect back now, and I think about the idea that, that maybe I was more of a pastor who prayed than I was a praying pastor, I wonder what could have been. I know there was fruit. I know that there was, there was wonderful things that happened and God in his grace always works with us. But, but I sometimes look back and, and say what might have been. See, one of the tricks of life is we never know what we could have had. We only know what we actually get. And so, my life as a general superintendent has really changed. I've been, I was a pastor for 18 years, a president for not quite two, and then I've been in this role going on now 11 years. And I have become more and more, not just a general superintendent who prays, I have become more and more a praying general superintendent. And let me tell you why. I have far less ability to control outcomes right now than I've ever had. So as a pastor, you could kind of change the trajectory of a church in a matter of a few months, Gary, you, you, because you have access. Uh, I, I, I could preach, I could teach, I could cast vision, I could raise funds, 
Uh, I, I could have coffee conversations. I could call board meetings. I had access to the people. Now there's two, two and a half million Nazarenes that are maybe probably more like two million Nazarenes. They don't even know me. I'm like a figurehead or, you know, some kind of a ecclesial authority, but they don't really know me. I mean, I don't have access to them. And not only that, as a, as a pastor, I had trust. Because, because even if they thought I had a wild and crazy idea, I mean, they would say, you know, David, I, I'm not sure about that, but, but David was there when my son ran away from home. And David was there when my mom died. And David was there when I was trying to get through this addiction. And, and so I had access, I had trust, I had buy-in. And now, you know, in 165 countries of the world, um, I don't have that. And so I've lost more control. But here's what the irony of that is. As I have, as I have felt less control over outcomes, I have become more dependent on God in prayer because I just say, God, if you don't show up in this, these things are not going to change. Now, it doesn't excuse my, I can't just stop working and stop trying to lead, but but now I have less control and I'm more dependent on God. And here's what's amazing to me. Even though I have less control with more dependence, I now have greater peace than I've ever had. I, I don't, it's not to say I never have any anxiety or concern. I, of course I do. But I live with such a, a deep peace about my role and my ministry and my future. Why? Because I have become so much more dependent on God and my understanding about what prayer actually is has so dramatically changed. So I want to talk about that tonight. And I'm going to make a promise to you. Tonight is a no guilt zone. If you think this is like I'm about to beat you up because your prayer life isn't what it should be, that is not what this is about. You'll have to go to another church to get that. I'm not going to do that tonight. But I think what, it, what can happen is the Holy Spirit can begin to give you, as you're pursuing the Christ-like life, a new understanding of at least this aspect of prayer that I pray will inspire you and will, will give you a new passion and a new understanding of the power of your praying life. So there's two passages I want to pull up on the screen. And these are just kind of jumping off points. But the first is Isaiah 62, uh, verses 6 and 7. O Jerusalem, I have posted watchmen on your walls. They will pray day and night continually. Take no rest, all you who pray to the Lord. And isn't this interesting? Interesting. Give the Lord no rest until he completes his work, until he makes Jerusalem the pride of the earth. So we're talking here about watchmen on your walls, people who pray day and night and continually. Say continually. The next verse is, is I think, a, a really important New Testament version of what I just read. And this is from the Apostle Paul's writing to, to the church in Ephesus. He says, pray in the Spirit most of the time and on some occasions. All right. Let's, let's pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for believers everywhere. And the word there for alert, it just means pay attention stuff's going on there's there's god is moving and at work in ways that you cannot even begin to understand and so paul's admonition is you got to you got to pay attention because god's always up to something and that's why you have to be persistent in your prayers are you a christian who prays or are you a praying Christian? So I want to talk to you for a few minutes about 
the idea of intercession. So this is just one aspect of prayer, but I want to talk about intercession. And as long as I'm confessing to you, I got another confession to make. There was also a time in my life when my perception of intercession was that it was extremely important to intercession, but it was basically for two groups of people. It was for old people and for monks. So people in monasteries. It was for old people who didn't have to work anymore. And, and so they basically carried the freight for all the people who worked all day long, or it was for people who prayed for a living. I was so wrong. Because what I discovered is, is that the definition of to intercede for someone, you know what it means? It means to act on behalf of someone. Or it means to stand in the gap for another person. Intercession is standing in the gap for someone. And, and here's my definition uh, that, I, that I came up with for the purpose of the book that would help me. Because there's wildly various definitions of intercession. So I came up with my own. Here's what it is. Intercession is specifically praying, say specifically, for those that God has providentially placed in your circle of relationships. And the three main words there are specific and providential and the phrase circle of relationships. So I want you to hold that tight for a minute. If you guys don't mind, leave that up for just a second. Sometimes people will say to me, I'm an intercessor. I, every single day, I pray for all the missionaries in Africa. Lord, I, Lord, I say, be with all the missionaries in Africa today. And, or they'll say something like, yeah, or I, I pray for all the hungry children in India. Lord, be with all the hungry children in India. And, and I, I always want to say, I'm glad you pray for those missionaries. I'm glad you pray for hungry children in India. But I don't think that's intercession. I don't think that's intercessory standing in the gap prayer. And here's why. Intercession requires that your love sees faces. Love sees faces. Look at what Dietrich Bonhoeffer has to say about intercession. He says, it is clear. Let's pull that up. Did I give you guys that? It is clear that intercessory prayer is not something general and vague, but it's something very concrete. It is interested in specific persons and specific difficulties and therefore specific requests. Do you think Bonhoeffer wants to get specificity out there? He says, the more concrete my intercessory prayer becomes, the more promising it is. That's an amazing definition of intercessory prayer. What he's saying is, it, it's so specific that your love sees faces. So intercession at its heart, when you stand in the gap for another person, is very specific. It's pondered. It's you bearing the weight on your heart of the burden of the people in the situations for which you pray. And two things happen, I think, when you stand in the gap, when you when you become an intercessor for another person or situation, you receive a gift and there's power that's given. Let me talk to you about the gift. The gift of intercession is that you receive discernment from God. You receive discernment from God. Now, let me, let me quickly break this down. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom and discernment. Knowledge is information. Knowledge is intellect. Uh, knowledge is IQ. You can gather a lot of information and have a very high intellect and have, have all of that and not be very wise. So, so you can have a lot of diplomas on your wall and it doesn't mean that you're a wise person. I know lots of smart people who aren't very wise. On the other hand, uh, and by the way, you don't have to be a Christian to have knowledge. It helps because God is the source of all wisdom, but you don't have to be a Christian to have knowledge. 
Wisdom, on the other hand, doesn't require that you have a formal education. You can, wisdom is, is you taking your practical experiences, the things that you have learned in life, and applying them in practical ways. So, so you don't have to have diplomas to be a wise person. Uh, you still have to have some knowledge there, but you don't have to be a Christian to have wisdom. There are some people who have wisdom who, don't, who are not Christians. All wisdom comes from God, yes, but, but stay with me. Discernment is different. Discernment, in my opinion, requires the Holy Spirit at work within you because discernment isn't just knowledge, and it's not even just wisdom. Discernment is more uh, nuanced than that. Discernment is being able to know the difference, not just between right and wrong, but between better and best. Sometimes discernment is knowing between, uh, you know, bad or worse. And sometimes your decisions have to be that. There's not a good decision. You just got to figure out which is the better of the two worst ones. Decision or discernment has to do with timing. Discernment has to do with uh, reading between the lines. You know, a part of discernment, the Holy Spirit kind of gives you that insight. Like when you're talking to someone, I don't know how many times this may have happened to our counselors here, but you just realize something is being given to you in this conversation from God that's not just coming from your knowledge or your wisdom. It's like a divine inspiration. It's like a, it's like a moment of clarity and discernment that is reading between the lines. So discernment, you are given the gift of discernment. If you want to know your spouse better, you might be married to them for 25 years, but if you've never really been an intercessor for your spouse, you start standing in the gap for them and the Lord's going to help you to understand them in a way you've never understood before. He's going to give you new wisdom, but he's also going to give you discernment into the needs that they have. It's the same thing when you pray for your children. As you pray for your kids, as you really stand in the gap for them, you're going to be a better parent because you're going to understand them differently because the Holy Spirit is giving you insight into them. You're going to know things that they don't even know that you know. Maybe they don't know that about themselves, but that's part of what happens when you stand in the gap. God gives you discernment for situations and people. Look at what Oswald Chambers says. He says, one of the most subtle and elusive burdens God ever places on us as saints is this burden of discernment concerning others. He gives us discernment. Why? So that we may accept the responsibility for those souls before him, and I love this phrase, Gary, and form the mind of Christ about them. That's a part of what discernment is. It's the forming the mind of Christ about the person that you're praying for. It's not that we're able to bring God into contact with our minds, but that we awaken ourselves to the point where God is able to convey his mind to us regarding the people for which we intercede. Finding the mind of Christ for the person that you're standing in the gap for. Have you ever had an intercessor? I'm not asking you if you ever had somebody pray for you. I know people have prayed for you, but but in my lifetime, I can only name, actually, even though I pastored many, 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 many people, I only know of a handful of people that I would consider to be real intercessors for me. Someone who stood in the gap for me and my family at, on a regular, ongoing basis. One of my intercessors, her name was Glayfree. G-L-A-P-H-R-E. It's a very unique name. Glayfree was the daughter of the pastor of Bethany First Church before I came. Glayfree was a school teacher. She was a lay person, but she became known all throughout the evangelical world as one of the, the most prominent persons on prayer. If you've never read her book, it's probably 30 years old now, but it's called When the Pieces Don't Fit, God Makes the Difference. If you've never read that book, to this day, it's one of the, it's one of the four or five most important books I've ever read on what it means to walk as a praying person and as a, a discerning person. Go get it on Amazon if you can find it. Glayfree, when the pieces don't fit, God makes the difference. The problem with Glayfree was she had a debilitating disease. And when I came to be her pastor, she, was, she had been bedridden for a number of years. She had not been able to 
get out of the house. She had certainly not been able to come to church, but her ministry of prayer stayed where she it from her bedside. And for the one year that I was her pastor before she went to heaven, Glayfrey asked if she could be an intercessor for me. And of course I said, yes, this is the way the arrangement would work. Glayfrey would call me about twice a month. And I told my assistant, I don't care if I'm in a meeting with the governor of Oklahoma. If Glayfrey calls, I want out of that meeting. I want to talk to Glayfrey because I knew I was going to hear from Jesus. And this is how the conversation, go. I could remember him like it was like right now. She would say, Pastor, this is Glay. I've been praying for you all night long. All night long. And then she would proceed to say, sometimes it was literally one word. This is what I think Jesus wants me to say to you. Sometimes it was a verse of scripture. Sometimes it was a phrase. But my brother and sister... I'm getting goosebumps right now. I cannot tell you how many times Clayfree said something to me that was exactly what I was dealing with. She knew things about me that I had never told her. She she had to have bugged my phone or, you know, had a had a camera in my office or something. No. What she had was intercession. And God was giving her the gift of discernment to know what perhaps my greatest needs were at any given moment. And I'm not even trying to say that Glayfree fully understood everything she was saying, but she understood enough to be able to communicate that she had paid the price to stand in the gap for Christy and I and our children. And, and so she had earned the right to say whatever she felt was needed to say. And I was listening. Believe me, I was listening. If you don't want somebody to know you, do not ask them to be an intercessor because they're going to know stuff if you ask them to be a stand-in-the-gap person for you because the gift of intercession at some point is discernment from the Holy Spirit. Are you with me on that? Okay, so that's the gift of intercession, but there's also the power of intercession. And the power for intercession is protection. And the protection, I think, works two ways. It works, first of all, in this way, that it provides a hedge of protection over the person that you're praying for. And I don't know exactly how this works. I just know that I'm pretty sure it's biblical, and I've seen it in experiential stuff, that, that somehow, as you truly stand in the gap for someone that you love, as your love sees their face, God provides a kind of protection over that person or over that situation that perhaps would not be there if you had not been standing in the gap. I'm not saying God is going to just let somebody get nuked if you're not praying for them, but I do believe it's true. When you, when you pray in an intercessory way for your child, I know for me there were many times when I was tempted as a kid to do stuff and make bad decisions, and you can call it your conscience, you can call it you know, your upbringing or your convictions or whatever it is, but I felt like I was just surrounded by my parents' prayers. So that's the one thing that happens when you stand in the gap. But here's the other thing. It, it provides a kind of protection of awareness of the person for which you're praying, that, that they become aware of the potential dangers that, that could come their way or stumbling blocks if they weren't paying attention. And so as you pray for them in a stand of the gap way, the power that comes to them is a kind of awareness of, of the potential harm. So let me tell you about another intercessor I had. It was a different church, and she was a very different lady, but her name was Joanne. And Joanne came to me. I was a young pastor. I was, I was in my early 30s. And she said to me, Pastor David, you're young. I know you and Christy have a good marriage, but I want you to know that I pray for you every day. I pray for, uh, I pray that you would not have sexual temptation. I pray that, that you would not be tempted by sexual temptation. And I, I'll be honest with you, I, 
I did my pastoral thing where I just, I smiled at her and I said, oh, thanks, Joanne. But on the inside, I was kind of doing an inner eye roll. You ever done that where you're just like, really? This is what you're praying for? Don't you know Christy and I have a great relationship? That's, that's not a problem for me right now. I mean, why are you praying that? That's kind of what I was thinking on the inside. A couple days went by and the Lord really checked me on that attitude. It was like the Lord kind of just said, David, who do you think you are? Do you think that maybe one of the reasons why sexual temptation is not an issue for you at this point in your life, do you think it's maybe because there's, uh, there's a person named Joanne who's specifically praying that it wouldn't be? And I went back to Joanne a couple of days later and I said, Joanne, I just, I need to apologize to you because I didn't take you very seriously. But I just want you to know how much I appreciate the way that you're praying for me. Please don't stop praying. I believe that her standing in the gap for me in that way made me aware of what could have been a potential danger that would have harmed my marriage or harm my ministry in some way. And I'm grateful that she stood in the gap for me. So there's two things that happen when you stand in the gap for someone through intercession. You're given the, the gift of discernment and they're give, there's a power of protection. Now, I want to shift gears and wrap this whole thing up. I want to, I want to get super practical with you for a second. Because, because a lot of this can just be theoretical but I want it to be very practical for you tonight. And I, you, don't, you don't have to have a, a seminary education to understand what I'm about to say to you. This is something that could apply to every single one of you. How do you practice this in your everyday life? Where do you even start? Because one of the things that I've talked to Christy about this many times, I think one of the reasons I felt like a failure in prayer, especially in this area of intercession for so many years, I didn't even know where to start. It's like, how many things can you possibly pray for in the world? And, and I think one of the things the enemy does is he gets you so overwhelmed with the needs that you just want to throw up your hands and say, why? I can't do that. So I'm not going to even do anything. And that's a lie from the enemy. So I'm going to give you the four things really quickly that, that I have begun to practice in my own life. And I think you can apply this to yours as well. I think the first place you start with your love seen faces and praying with specificity and standing in the gap for people is you start with the people who know you best and who are closest to you in your life. You start with your immediate circle. You remember that, that definition, the circle of relationships? You start with the people closest to you. And, and for me, my closest person in the world is my wife. So I pray every day for Christy by name and by situation and by, because I know her well. I pray for my children every day, by name, by situation. And, and I, I had kind of a, a head start on this because I had a praying dad. So my alarm clock, my dad wasn't a pastor, but my alarm clock for 18 years was not something beside my bed. It was something coming out of the little kitchenette by my little bedroom. My dad, every day that I can remember, sat in that kitchen chair before work, and I heard him calling my name out and my sister's name out to God every single day. That's what I woke up to. Sometimes it was fine. Sometimes I hated it. But that's, that was, so I knew when I became a father that it was my responsibility and my privilege to pray for my children. So it was like the Lord was saying, who knows them better than you do? Whose responsibility is it to pray for your children? Is it your, their Sunday school teacher, their youth pastor, their grandma, or maybe their, maybe their Gigi? But, but no, I knew it was my privilege and my responsibility to pray for them because I knew them most. They had been given to me from God. So it was my job. And one of the things that I had told my kids, and they know this to this day, when your mom and I retire, or when we go to heaven, rather, hopefully those aren't at the same time, but when we're not going to leave you a bunch of stuff. We just, we're not, we don't have a bunch of stuff to leave you materially, but
but I'm going to make a promise to you. As long as I have breath in my lungs, you can be assured that there's going to be one person in the world who's calling your name out to the Father every single day. You can count on it. And my kids now, as grown adults, they still, every now and then, they'll text me and they'll say, Dad, I know you're praying for me today. Here's what I'm dealing with. So you start with the people you're closest to. You want to have greater intimacy with your spouse? Be, be an intercessor. Because they've been given to you. They're in their closest circle of relationships. Start with your family. If you're single, pray for your roommate. If you're, if you're pray for your parents. Pray for your siblings. It, everybody gets to know who's in their circle. Okay? That's where you start. Easy. That's kind of a no-brainer, but then I move to the second thing that you do, or, or I do, in my, in my circle of relationships, I pray for my colleagues in ministry. I pray for the people who are closest to me. Now, it used to be that I would pray for our pastoral team and their families, or I would pray for my board members. You know, even if my church was a couple of hundred people, that's a lot of people to try to pray for, and I I would pray for them as needs came up, but I, it was like every day I was praying specifically for my staff, my team. For some of you, it's the person uh, in the desk ne next to you, in the cubicle. Maybe if you're at school, it's the person that you locker with, your best friends. Who is it that God has brought into your circle of cl close relationships? Maybe it's your neighbors. You may not even like where you live, but the one thing you can't say is that you're randomly placed there. Wherever you are, it's because God put you there. And so now you have a, a privilege to pray for people that are all around you and, and lift them up to the Lord, stand in the gap. Who else is going to pray for your neighbor? So are you with me? So that's where you, you start with the close circle, you move to the next circle, and here's where these last two, this is where I... I've really become fascinated with intercessory prayer because the first two are kind of like logical. But, but these last two, number three, I have learned to pray for what is important to me. You pray for what is important to you. What's your passion? What's your greatest desires? You say, David, that's, that's the most subjective thing you could possibly pray for. I mean, how do I even know that what's important to me is important to God? How, isn't that just selfish if I'm only praying for things that, uh, that I really love? Well, well, let me ask you a question. What does the verse mean in Psalm 37, 4, when it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So when you, do, when you commit your way to God, when he becomes your delight and your priority, does that mean that God's going to give you all the things you want in life? Does it mean you're going to get, you know, a great home and lots of good health and children who are obedient and great career? And No, that's not what that means. You are going to get, you're going to have blessings, but that's not what that means unless you're into the prosperity gospel. But what if it means, as you delight yourself in the Lord, that he begins to put the desires and passions in your heart that you have to build the kingdom? What if the desires of your heart are things that God is placing there? Now you say, but it might start out kind of self-centered. Well, you know, Dallas Willard says something really interesting. Pull this up, and I'm not going to read the whole paragraph for you, but, but, you know, basically what he says, a lot of people don't pray about in an intercessory way because there are good things that don't really matter to them. But he goes on to say, um, the circles of our interests will inevitably grow in the largeness of God's love. What's he trying to say? He's saying the more you delight yourself in the Lord and the more passion that begins to well up in you, eventually those things that started out so small and maybe even self-serving as you continue to offer those desires to God, he expands them and grows them into something that you're praying in ways that align with his will, that align with his purpose, so that his heart is becoming your heart and his passions are becoming your passions. He gives you the desires of your heart. 
You ever notice how some people, like all they can talk about is, is human trafficking? And you, you say, man, I know this is a serious issue. I know it's important, but that's all you can talk about. Why? It's because God has made that a desire of their heart. Somebody else is foster care. All they, foster care this, foster care that. I get it. Why is it so important to them? It's not that it's, it's not important, but it's not as important to you. Why? Because God had made it their desire of their heart. So it's their passion coming out. So the question is, what has God given you to be passionate about? You don't have to be passionate, deeply passionate about every issue, but you better know what a few of the desires of your heart are, and then you begin to pray about that. I told you, uh, I think it was Sunday night, about the five guys in my church that went every morning, like on a Wednesday morning for six months before work and prayed for David Busick's salvation. The most miserable six months of my life. But you know what? God had made my salvation the desire of their heart. And that's why they couldn't get over it. And that's why they were standing in the gap for me. And I'm so thankful that they paid attention and that God put that passion into their heart. What if, what if that became a passion for you? Maybe, what if it was just one person's salvation that, that you just, you said, I am committed to stand in the gap to pray for, with specificity for that person to come to know Jesus. Do you think that could make a difference over time? Of course it could. So God will give you the desires of your heart. That's number three. You pray for what is important to you and let the largeness of God's love expand that into God-oriented desires and passions. And here's the last one. You start with your closest circle. You go to your next circle of relationships. You pray for what's important to you. And this one, I love it. You pray over divine appointments. Sometimes people will ask me as a general superintendent, how, how do you intercede for the world? You pray for 700 missionaries by name every day. You pray for 165 countries. I don't. Maybe Gustavo Crocker does. Maybe Philly Chombo does. Maybe Carla Sundberg does. But that's not what I do. When I decide on what to pray for, I base it on one simple concept. I believe that God orders my steps. Psalm 37 says, oh man, you got to memorize this one. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Listen, God delights in every detail of your life. He loves it. He's so interested in every intricate detail of your life. You know, sometimes and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you have to pray over every single decision you make. You know, like, where do I go to lunch today? Maybe, you know, do I go to Chick-fil-A today or, or do I go to KFC? You don't have to pray about that. You know you're supposed to go to Chick-fil-A. But, but, but if you have come to the point in your life where you think God just kind of saved you, but then he checked out or he kind of lives distance, a distance away from you and doesn't really care about your everyday life, I, I want to say this to you in love. You have become a functional agnostic. If you think God is just checked out of your daily life, that's called agnosticism. And you might even be a Christian, but, but God cares about the details of your life. And, and, be, and because that's true, you have to believe that every single day is filled with open doors. And every single day is full of opportunities and divine appointments every single day. Divine appointments, intersections await. But it's just that, as was said earlier, we're not staying alert to those. We're not paying attention. 
What if every person you ran into in a, in a day was not there randomly or by coincidence or by accident? What if those were divinely appointed? I'm not talking about God overtaking your will and forcing you to do stuff. He's not going to take your free will away. But don't you think God can order your steps? Don't you think if you're living in alignment and obedience with him, that he's going to give you open doors if you're paying attention? What if that lady at the checkout center in Walmart who's standing on that little rubber mat so she doesn't get shin splints in 10 hours? What if the two minutes you have with her was actually a divine appointment. What if, what if, oh, you said I could have chose, I could have chosen a different aisle. Well, then that lady became your divine appointment. But, but I can't tell you how many times I, I praying for the person who's checking me, checking, <laughs> checking me out. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm praying for the person that's checking my stuff out and my groceries. And so, and, and sometimes I say, what, hey, I see their name tag. I say, Karen, how long have you been working today? Oh, I'm just getting started. I say, you have a long day? You know how many times I have heard someone's life story in 30 seconds? And I'm just like, and I just, and sometimes I've even told them, you know what, I, I'm a Christian and I pray to God. If it's okay, Karen, I'm going to pray for you through the rest of this day that God would meet you exactly where he wants to meet you and that you can learn that, to trust him. Divine appointments, the guy who jogs by every day, the, the person who delivers your mail, the person at the gas station, the person who cuts you off in traffic. Those are all opportunities of standing in the gap for people. Uh, how many of you know who Jim Deal is? Jim Deal is a general superintendent emeritus one of my favorite people in the world. He told me one time something very important. He said, David, the spirit works in your life through checks and prompts. He said, the check is the red light from the spirit. Don't do that, David. Don't say that. Don't, that's a bad attitude, David. It, you, that's, that's the red light. And sometimes the spirit says, stop. Sometimes the Spirit's going to say, don't say that to that person. Sometimes the Spirit's going to say, you can't trust that person. Okay, That's, we're keeping it real. But he said the other side of it is that he, that he also speaks through prompts. And the prompts are the green lights of the Spirit. Say this, David. Give her that note, David. Send, send them that money, David. Text them, David. Those, those are the times where the Spirit impresses on you to do something for someone else. Um, impressions. Have you ever been driving down the road and, and you see a person that said, you know, it looks like Gary Merritt. That, that, that looks a lot like Gary, you know, but, but wait a minute. No, that's a Corvette. Gary drives an F-150 pickup or something. So, but boy, that looks like Gary. Did he get a new car? No, that's not. But now you're driving down the road, and now all you can think about is Gary Merritt. Was that just something triggering and firing in your brain? Or are you a Christian where God is ordering your steps? What if that's actually the Holy Spirit prompting you now that you hadn't even thought about Gary before, but now you can't quit thinking about Gary, and so you say, Lord, how can I pray for Gary? Well, you don't know what he's going through. The Lord knows. So you pray for Gary. Maybe you even feel prompted to send him a text. But, but this is what I'm talking about. Staying alert, paying attention, the divine appointments everywhere. I was, I was having dinner in Mozambique, Maputo, Mozambique. It was like, or lunch. No, I'm sorry, breakfast. I was eating my omelet. It was seven o'clock in the morning and so, a pastor came to my mind. I hadn't thought about him in like years. He's a great pastor on the... On, on the West Coast, he's been a faithful pastor for, you know, many years. But now I'm thinking about him, and I start praying for him, and then I feel impressed. You need to text him. Well, I'm thinking it's 7 o'clock in the morning in Maputo, so it's got to be like midnight where he is. But, but I just, the, press, the impression grew stronger, 
and more persistent. So I said, I better pay attention. So I text him. And I mean, it wasn't minutes, it was seconds before I get a text back from him. And he, and I just had said, I said, Steve, I'm praying for you, thinking about you today. Uh, I love you. And God is thinking about you too. He writes me back immediately. I can't believe you texted me. He said, today has been the worst day of ministry I've had in my entire career. And I'm sitting here on this Saturday night trying to think, what am I going to say to my people tomorrow morning? And I felt so alone. And I felt like God wasn't even listening to me. And he said, when I got your text, I, I knew God was with me. I don't take any credit for that. I was eating an omelet. I'm just trying to pay attention to the faithfulness of God. And God, if you're paying attention, God is going to be faithful to prompt you and impress upon you how to pray and stand in the gap for people all around you. I'm convinced of that. So I have a theory. This is the last thing I'm going to say. So Ryan, come on up, brother. I have a theory. If every Christian in the world today would only be faithful to pray for the daily and moment-by-moment promptings from the Holy Spirit and for the people in your specific sphere of influence, if that's all you prayed for was to be faithful to those promptings, you know what would happen? There would be an, an intercessory prayer covering of the entire world, minute by minute, hour by hour, and day by day, and the, the sun would never set on the blanket of righteous prayer. Why? Because God's prompting billions of other Christians to do the same thing. You don't have to cover the whole world. Just take the pressure off. Don't let the enemy get you defeated over the fact you're overwhelmed with what to pray for. You pray for his promptings, his desires, your circle of relationships, and you trust that the rest is being covered by a billion other Christians out there who are doing the same thing. You want to know the reason I know that this is so important to God? I know this is right at the center of the heart of God to intercede and stand in the gap. Because that's what the Bible says that Jesus is doing right now for you, for me. The crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended, exalted Jesus is interceding for you right now. He's standing in the gap for you. He's with specificity. And if it's that important to Jesus, I want it to be that important for me. So take heart. The, the possibilities of what God could do through your life and that just the deepened relationship that you come just to, to live near the heart of the Father. Oh, man, this is exciting. So here's what I want us to do as we close. Would you like to pray right where you are? I mean, you, you, surely you can't have a sermon about prayer and not invite people to pray. So you, I want you just to take a few minutes right there where you are and, and just offer yourself up to God and say, God, I don't just want to be a Christian who prays. I want to become a praying Christian that you can trust me to stand in the gap for the people that you put into my life. And Lord, would you give me some desires for things that you want me to really begin to, to intercede for? And watch how God will begin to prompt you and make you alert. So take a minute. Just bow your heads right now.
You say, I don't know how to talk to God. You talk to God like you talk to a, a friend. Tell him what's in your heart. God's not impressed by big theological words. God's impressed by people who need him. He's impressed by people who come to him with honest hearts. You talk to God just the way you want to. Be honest with him. 